Rome now says, since a lot of people find science a little bit intimidating and scary, what could be better for Halloween than to talk about some of the parts of science that scientists themselves can't explain? Since I'm a physicist and have a particular preference for particle and nuclear physics, I thought we'd focus on five problems in physics that scientists can't explain. So let's get to it. Number one, the arrow of time. Let's start with a biggie. Very few models and theories in physics actually care which direction time is going in. The majority of physical models are happy running backward and forward, so it really comes down to those few that don't play with the same rules and they actually care whether the past is behind the future or not. One of those is the second law of thermodynamics. The second law tells us that where energy is not entering a system because it's a closed system, that the energy within the system will decay over time. This is called entropy and by its very nature it requires that time flows in a certain order. Unfortunately this leads us to a problem. Nobody can tell us why entropy works like this and thus nobody can tell us why time has to flow according to the arrow of time from start to finish. Now my personal explanation got jotted down on the back of a notepad in a physics lecture when I first started thinking about this way way back. It's not tested, it's not accepted by everyone, it's just my personal theory and it's called the quantum history model of time and this requires that the universe exists the way it does but time does not exist in the way that we normally consider it. Instead of having a steady flow from start to finish, time in the quantum history model is separated into distinct quantum states. So you have this point in time here and this point in time here and they don't necessarily have to interact. This is the important part of the quantum history model. Instead of having a standard arrow of time where you go from there to there, the quantum history model says that you have a point here which is the point in the past and which point it joins onto as the next point in history depends on the probability scale. And this one here is more probable, so quantum history goes from there to there. But next time, that one over there isn't quite as probable a state as that one here, just directly below this one, so your time goes there instead. Unfortunately, this allows effect to happen before cause, which we have seen does happen sometimes in certain quantum states, perhaps, but we're not entirely sure, and it does seem to explain a few things. However, it's not tested, like I said, and it still doesn't explain entropy. It doesn't explain why past to future has to happen in that order. So, anyone who wants to go out and test that model, feel free. You never know, you might get a prize from it. But if you can understand why entropy is doing what it is and why it has to go in a certain order of time, then there's probably a Nobel Prize in it for you. So good luck with that one. Let's move on to the second one. Number two, ball lightning. Ball lightning is cool. It's lightning, but it's in a ball form. However, it's totally unexplained. So if you want a Nobel Prize and you don't really fancy talking about entropy and trying to work out why everything has to go in a certain order, then perhaps this is one for you. We know very little about ball lightning, but what we do know is that it's luminous. You can actually see it, which has a distinct advantage over some of the other ones we're going to be talking about today. And it has no set size. We've seen ball lightning range in diameter from the width of a fingernail to larger than an average person. In nature, it usually happens alongside a thunderstorm, but not always. And it invariably explodes. So good luck with that one. Number three, high temperature superconductivity. Now that's a mouthful. Okay everyone, if you can solve this, your eternal fame and fortune is practically guaranteed. This will cause a second computer revolution. There's no two ways about it. And the reason for that is that currently materials do not superconduct at room temperature. If they could, our computers that we have now would be less powerful than a pocket calculator in comparison to what we could have. Take Star Trek's massive computers, nothing compared to what we could do if we had superconductors that worked at room temperature. And we can have if you can solve this problem. You see, nobody can properly explain why we have so few materials that can superconduct at anything above 25 Kelvin. And when you can only get to 25 Kelvin, nobody can get a room temperature superconductor to work. It's just not possible under what we have now. And if you're wondering what the high temperature part of what I was talking about is, well, just remember that zero Kelvin is absolute zero, the lowest temperature possible in the universe, unless you get into weird, weird quantum effects, which give you negative temperatures, which are just weird. And absolute zero is the point where an object has no thermal energy. It is literally the coldest thing you can get. By the way, 
just as a comparison, room temperature is approximately 300 Kelvin. So if you can work out how to get a superconductor to work at room temperature, the world will change because of you. You will go down in history. So go for it. We'd like to see what you can do. Now here's one that's going to come out of left field for some people. Number four, the nucleus. I kid you not. You've got to remember that Rutherford and his famous scattering experiment only occurred in 1909. We have only had just a tad over a hundred years of knowing what the structure of the atom actually is. We've done an awful lot of amazing science with that knowledge in just a hundred years, but we still don't know everything about it. For example, you'll know that the plum pudding model got knocked straight out by Rutherford when he came in with his scattering experiment. We now know that protons and neutrons exist within an atomic nucleus and electrons orbit in shells around this nucleus. What holds the nucleus together? Hands up if you know. Did you hold up your hand and say the nuclear force? Great. Of those of you who had your hand up, put them down a moment, but of those of you who had their hand up, anyone who actually knows what the nuclear force is, please raise your hand. Wow, none, because we don't know. And that's what this unsolved problem is. Nobody knows what the nature of the nuclear force actually is. So if you can work that one out, you'll go down in history books. And you'll have an extra bonus point of you too can have an experiment that will go in universities and make students tear their hair out. The same way that I teared my hair out when I couldn't replicate Rutherford's scattering experiment. Okay, quick scenery change because someone tried to firm me in the middle of videoing. Let's get straight into it. Last but not least, it's one that has confused people since the first time a person ever found a magnet. It's number five, magnetic monopoles. Have you ever had a magnet and you've realised that it's going north and a south? So you've tried to cut it in half, so you've got one magnet that's just north and one magnet that's just south. And have you then found that actually what you've got is two smaller magnets of the same style as the original one, and a lot of wasted time? Well, a lot of scientists have looked at that and went, you know, why can't we have just a magnet that's all north or a magnet that's all south? That's what a magnetic monopole would be. No one has ever found a way to have a particle that is just a north or just a south. We've had a couple that appear to be artificially created magnetic monopoles, and that's fantastic. That's a good step in the right direction, but we still don't know why we can't have a particle. and We've never discovered a particle. So if you can do that, that's Nobel Prize territory right there. Now, some theories suggest that a long time ago, really, really a long time ago, like near the dawn of the universe, there would have been exotic particles that had some kind of magnetic charge and that these would have allowed us to have magnetic monopoles. And it seems to be that that's why we ha now have quantized units of charge. But we can't detect a monopole. We can't actually prove it one way or another. And this has led to the fact that we can't find a monopole particle and we don't have naturally occurring monopoles. So if you can work out why that is, that's Nobel Prize territory as well. So go for it. All the best here and let's hope that we actually work these things out. Okay, that's really all I've got time for today. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you did like this. If you did, remember to click the like button, share it with your friends so that they can see what could get them a Nobel Prize too. And do subscribe to future videos because there will be more in the future. But until next time, I've been Zoe Kirk Robinson. You've been watching The Knob Mouse Show and I'll see you tomorrow.